Hey guys, Nick here. Just heads up, there's some mature language in this episode. Wanted to give you a fair warning. All right, let's get to it. Hey, welcome to Minor Details. I'm James. And I'm Reed. And mm-hmm. we are two industrial designers in the big city. Sweating the small stuff. <laughs> yeah, I've memorized my lines at this point. <laughs> I know what I have to say. We have Reed Schlegel back on the podcast because Nick is out of town, North Carolina, at a family reunion. That's what we're telling people. Yes, yeah. it is. He's actually... You don't know where he is. We haven't seen him in days. <laughs> He's actually involved in some Chinese genetic testing. Wow. They're making him into a super industrial designer. You know, in Star Wars, you find out that Boba Fett's a clone. Oh, yeah. It's like Nick. (laughs) There's an (laughs) army of Nicks everywhere. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. And in China, making all the design work now from now on. So anyway, we have that future to look forward to. Wow. And uh, Reed, how you doing? I'm good. I'm a little scared now. They know there's a clone war of (laughs) of Nicks walking around. But yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the things are good. Yeah, we were at the uh, Core 77 Awards last night mm-hmm. um, because uh, some work that we both that we both did got honored, actually. Yeah, actually, I'm not sure if the project was on one or if it was an honorable mention. I think it was runner-up. Yeah. So um, I realized the, this morning I felt weird raising my hand to be a winner and then finding out today that it wasn't a winner. And I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> whoops. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, runner-up. It's still it's still valuable. Like you know, it was it was on the website. It's they true. they put it up there. The internet does not forget. So no, it's there. So um so yeah the uh, the backdrop packaging. Mm-hmm. Um, do you want to speak a little bit about it? Who worked on it? Yeah, I mean it's this project that I was fortunate enough to work on at Arleden, where I did not do any of the branding or the packaging. I did the out of box experience. So it was supposed to be this whole like influencer kit and what you get when you open it and then it ended up being the thing that everyone gets which is great for the essentials kit so it's basically a pegboard that you take it out you can prop it up keeps all your paint and everything off the floor and it has a nice little feeling to like your dad's workshop when you were growing up as a kid with the pegboards and all the different yeah. things so it was fun that was literally something that we did in a few weeks and then all of a sudden it's real and it won this cool award and i was going to go to the party anyway so it was nice yeah. to find out that it won something yeah that's the funny thing is i was also going to go to the party anyway and then that morning found out um that the peloton treadmill actually got first place in its category for sports and recreation award so that's awesome i have to give a big shout out i mean it was a big team so anthony michella marine curio uh who was last name i don't think i've ever pronounced out loud so there you go uh jason poor john consiglio mark cruz nigel alcorn lee hendrickson and last and a little bit least james connors i designed I have to. I have to only take. I can only take credit for one part of the treadmill, which is the neck of the treadmill. Uh, Everyone knows the neck is the sexiest part of the body. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I guess that's true. I tried. <laughs> I tried to make that the most. Uh, I don't know if that's neck the, and ankles. Yes. Yeah. So I um I designed the neck, which is actually. You can't really see it too much in these photos, but then I my biggest contribution to the whole experience was designing the the weights and the resistance mm-hmm. bands. Um, so if you're watching the YouTube video, you can see those on the floor there. You made the Copic markers of weights. They just don't roll anywhere. They, no. they stay put. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, that like that whole thing is very intentional because Peloton, you know, it's it's this whole thing of inviting people into fitness that haven't necessarily mm-hmm. been engaged in fitness before. And to make products that don't stigmatize them, like mm-hmm. don't don't make them like feel like, oh my gosh, this this is like gym equipment. I I I wouldn't know how to use that. That's a little intimidating. Um, so yeah, especially for those like kind of floor exercises where you're using weights. Oh yeah, it's for good. like push ups, like military like push ups. Yeah. So uh, and also they were designed to resemble an upholster an upholstered pillow. Um, so yeah. Uh, but I have to give a big shout out to the team who like really 
worked on the treadmill, like the, the overall form aesthetic, the assembly, it's just like a beautiful piece of hardware. Um, so congratulations to them. And, uh, yeah. So Reed, that's great. Yeah. Guys. Yeah. So we, we had a great time at the party last night. Uh, thanks for core 77 for, for hosting us at the Kickstarter headquarters. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. Beautiful garden. It was really awesome. Yeah. Rooftop garden. Mm. I, I wonder you always like you go into those offices and you go into those spaces and you're just kind of curious about like, did the employees ever use that space? I would hope so. Yeah. Like they're like, no, I'm going to take a, take this call by uh, the, you know, the pine tree. Yeah. Up there. It's a meeting room. You can book it. Yeah. Up there and like, yeah, I have the bench next to the elm. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, but it's, it's a beautiful space in, in Greenpoint, mm-hmm. um, which you're currently exiled in. Yeah. Reed. Temporarily living in Greenpoint. Yeah. Because my landlord two days before moving called up and goes, Hey, so we're putting you in this great apartment. And I was like, the one I signed a lease for. <laughs> He's like, no, a better one. And I was like, wait, can we rewind a little bit and talk yeah. about why? So it failed inspection. Uh, my uh, girlfriend works for the city, so she walked in being like, I love to negotiate, and I know everything, so it was very smooth when we had to figure it all out, but yeah. we're temporarily living in Greenpoint, and we are going to move to bed once that finally gets sorted out. Yeah, mm-hmm. but I have to say that walking around Greenpoint last night, I do really like that neighborhood. It's great. It's actually really nice it's where i kind of see it as like a staycation where yeah. it's a neighborhood that i never would have attempted to live in because i always thought the trains were so annoying. right but actually my commute to work is 15 minutes faster than it used to be yeah um and there's always cool restaurants bars and coffee shops everywhere yeah and i was told there's so many coffee shops there because there are so many people that move there because the trains aren't good because they're freelancers oh. and that's why there's so many coffee shops everywhere interesting yeah, yeah i was thinking about like how it is kind of this island in the middle of brooklyn mm-hmm. and if you're it's like that mitch hedberg joke like <laughs> if you get lost in the woods just like build a house and that's where you live yeah it's like they've they've made that place so cool because yeah you're not really you don't have great access to transportation so yeah. just make it really cool and you never have to leave it's like a polish slash hipster paradise yeah. it's great oh yeah pierogies it's a pierogi heaven there's a bar down the street for me i want to go to 75 cent pierogies at happy hour and five dollar beers oh and yeah i'll get you a, i might get you a cab because getting from here to here is kind of hard <laughs> but Hopefully those pierogies will get you up my yes. a little bit. Reed, Reed orders me cabs often. He's like, come meet me at Greenpoint. Yes, I'm like, your chariot awaits. <laughs> I got you the Uber share. We have to walk seven blocks. <laughs> hey, man, it's cheap. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to argue with that. But uh, speaking of all the research you've done on your neighborhood, clearly, oh, man. We, I'm, we ch- here in the minor details, we try to make our segues as smooth as possible, and it doesn't always happen it's that pretty, way. It's pretty smooth. Thank you. I didn't see it coming. Yes. Yeah. That's that's the best kind of segue. A hit and run. Oh, man. Uh, but uh, but yeah, so I wanted to talk with Reed uh, about research today because mm-hmm. I feel like, you know, between the two of us, you've worked at a couple firms where I feel like research is kind of at the forefront, mm-hmm. especially with smart design. Uh, like that's my impression of them yeah. is that research is really at the forefront of the process. And I was hoping that you might be able to impart some wisdom on research, like, you know, the types of research, when to do those types of research. And like for somebody who works somewhere that research isn't necessarily built into the process, Mm -hmm. how could they incorporate that, incorporate that in even just like small ways? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I mean, this is also kind of for my benefit as well. Dude, this is a, it's a lot of weight on my shoulders right now. I know, but, uh, but let's, let's start, let's just take it bit by bit. Okay. Um, you know, we obviously learned some research techniques I would say in, in college, Mm -hmm. but I'm curious, like coming into smart design day one, like what you were exposed to. So it was interesting going from Virginia Tech, and I feel like most universities where they teach you hardcore, identify the problem, talk to people, figure out what the right thing to solve is before you start figuring out what it looks like and how to actually like, implement it. Right. And going to SMART, it was a lot of really working through who is the user, what do they need, how do you solve it, and what does it look like? Yeah. And then how do you manufacture it? 
all the things that go into making something actually a real product. Right. So there it was a lot of really hardcore traditional industrial design research where we would have um, user studies where we'd have people come in. So we'd have focus groups where I would go and get a brief, do a bunch of research, make a bunch of prototypes that I would think would be useful or interesting in some way. We would have participants come in. Because when I was there, I was doing a lot of products for Oxos. They were like right. kitchen home good things. So were these all functional prototypes or were they Mostly, aesthetic? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've shouted him out, I think, every time I've been here. So I'm going to keep it going. Ron, yeah. who runs the shop at Smart, um, we would build all these prototypes. And then these people would come in and they would try them. They would work more or less. It might not be the prettiest thing, but they would get the function across. Right. And we'd have people come in and do these um, like observation sessions. And we'd basically see how they used it, how it worked. And then from there, we'd kind of refine them another step. Right. And then we would usually go and do in-home research yeah. um, or in-home testing. Uh-huh. Um, they can kind of be interchangeable. But it was just a really good way for you to actually observe people and see how they use things. And as I'm saying this, there's an alternate way you could do it where before you get to prototypes, we would actually go and we would hire people or just pay friends and family to let us watch them at home or right. in a scenario so we do things like shop alongs where say we were designing a spray mop or something we would take people to bed bath beyond give them x amount of money for free and then say shop we want to see if you're trying to clean your home what you gravitate towards oh. what you're buying why that's this what brands you trust what things that maybe might be outside the category that you think could be interesting and fun right um and then sometimes we would have them buy that, then go back to their homes and watch them use it. Yeah. Or it would just be, can we come and observe you clean your kitchen for two hours right. and have someone take photographs, someone take notes and somebody who is leading the interview. Yeah. And those are all different ways that are kind of the same output that you can get insights that you can use to make things. Yeah. Wow. I have so many questions already. So for one thing, when you're, yeah, when you're going through these observations, like when you would invite people to smart, like are all of these observations taking place where the person is doing something in front of you and you're sitting there watching them? Like, Mm -hmm. is there always, or is it like behind glass or like anything like that? So since I've left, they put in a one-way mirror. So they have that now. But back then it was always... When you're doing design research, you probably never really want more than two or three people because then you start right. overwhelming someone. Yeah. And it's already awkward for somebody who doesn't know design and feels like their opinion isn't important yeah. um, when it is because they don't realize that they literally are the expert. And that's right. something you always need to remind people is say, literally be honest. I am the novice here. You are the expert. Right. Please, anything you say is going to be useful. There's no such thing as something that's dumb or something yeah. that's unhelpful. We just want to have a conversation and like make it very open. And we would sit there and just watch and have a conversation and a dialogue. Usually, it's good to have one person who's actually leading the discussion. Mm-hmm. Too many voices. People can kind of jump over each other. It's also super awkward if you're leading a design research session and you have a client with you and the client has an agenda yeah. and they want to know something and right. you have like a good flow and a rapport and they're like, but what color should it be? <laughs> like, do you love it when it does this? And yeah. it's like, you can't ask leading questions like that. Right. That ruins the whole flow. So it was just basically someone taking photos, someone taking notes and somebody yeah. uh, actually participating with somebody. Right. Yeah. Cause that, that was the, that's the thing that like strikes me with this whole conversation is, like, how do you make this person comfortable in the situation mm-hmm. when you're bringing them in? Like, is it is it just about that idea of, like, we're a bunch of idiots here and you're an expert and we just, like, want to, you know, absorb your expertise? Mm-hmm. Like, is that the, the number one technique or are there other things around that? I think that's a big part of it. Honestly, it's something I learned was... I've been told I have resting bitch face a lot of the time. <laughs> and that's something I learned. Like you, you have to be enjoyable to be around in design research. Right. You need to make these people feel comfortable. You can't feel like you're too stern and you're watching them. Yeah. It's like, imagine you're talking to somebody that you know, right. And you kind of need to put yourself out there and be a little bit more, I don't know, engaged and energetic than you might be in your normal personality. Yeah. And I think that goes a long way in making somebody feel comfortable. Um, also something that always helps is when we would do it, um, a sad fact about design is that design research is always the thing, not always, but it's one of the main things that gets cut out because of budget. Right. People always are like, Oh, we want to know all this stuff. And like, how much is that going to cost? Oh, what can you do with $10,000 instead? Right. And then it's like, okay, we can do like 
two days of user sessions or something like that. Yeah. So what we would do to get around that a lot of times is do friends and family and have them come in. Right. So like my mom, my aunts, I've had um, one of my best friends, Flores and Aaron, like yeah. come in and do it. And they get paid a few hundred bucks for the day. They get their parking paid for. We get to go out for drinks afterwards. Right. But it's like a cheaper way to get some people in opposed to having people through. There are actually facilities that will like facilitate getting you participants and they are pricey. Right. So if you can bring in people, it's cheaper. But the reason I started this tangent was you already have a little bit of rapport with them. Right. Um, it's never good to interview someone you're too close with. Like me interviewing you would not be good. Yeah. But like you interviewing my friend Flores, who you know, but you're not best friends. That's right. fine. Like yeah. that's like, it's not weird. You're not best friends. So you can still gain in- insights, but you kind of skip that step of the awkward introduction in the beginning. Right. Now you said like, you know, certain leading questions like, you know, specifics on color or mm-hmm. whatever, you know, that those are kind of things you would want to avoid. Are there any other types of questions that you want to avoid? Yeah, I mean, I think when I was there, I always give smart design a ton of credit because they took a risk on me being right out of school, take a job there. So when I first started doing these, I made a bunch of mistakes. And my manager, Russell at the time, or anyone else who was more senior than me would basically take me aside and say, okay, here are some things you have to change. Mm. And when you're talking to people, it's always about digging deeper, like what, where, when, why questions. Right. It's never asking a specific thing. Like if we're talking about your LaCroix and you say, oh, I just really love these cans. And then you stop talking and say, oh, well, what about them? Yeah. Where do you, well, why do you buy those? Where did you find them originally? Right. And just asking questions in the back of your mind, you know what you want to find out. You don't ask that question. You ask vague questions that can start steering you that way. But that's only how the conversation starts. I feel like you always start thinking you want it to go one direction and you kind of need to forget that right. because if you do, you're just going to get what you want yeah. and not what's new and interesting. Yeah. And I think if you kind of lose yourself in the interview, you'll end up in some weird tangential place you never would have thought. And then you'll find some cool nuggets that you can take out and use later for yeah. actual concepting. That's interesting. So, you know, we were talking before about rather than like searching for, I mean, I guess my question is, is like, you know, working with a client like OXO, is OXO coming to you and saying like, we want this specific thing designed? Or were they saying like, we want something that does this? Mm -hmm. And like, we don't know what that is or what that looks like. Yeah. But like, could you, could you figure out what that is and sort of creating the brief through the research? I think it's both for OXO. OXO was a really great client because they understand design and the value of design and also letting the design process unfold. Right. So sometimes it'd be like, we need a better mandolin. Hmm. And then they'd say, you can figure out what that means. But sometimes it'd be like, we want to revolutionize how people cut food. Hmm. What does that mean? Hmm. So those are types of things where you could go wide or right. you can go small. But either way, they were open enough to kind of let you do your thing. And that's something about design research. A lot of times the client is a really big factor because if they want to stranglehold the whole thing, having clients who want to participate in research is great, but you need to also keep them at a certain distance from the research. Right. That way they're not affecting it to get them what they want. Like I said a minute ago, you want to make sure it's as organic as possible because like you said before, how do you keep it from being awkward? It can get really awkward really easy if people are overbearing mm. and you want to make sure there's room to breathe and have that stuff come out naturally. Right. Yeah. I'm curious, like if you have had situations where you've had to like, you know, say it's not a client like OXO, a client that you kind of have to lead through the process mm-hmm. and make them aware of how important it is and how important it is that they, 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 well, I guess I don't know that you would ever tell a client like you need to stay away, but yeah, that's really <laughs> is, hard. <laughs> like, is there a situation that that you can recall or just like a method of detaching them from the process, make or, but while also like making them understand why it's so significant? Mm-hmm. I mean, I feel like if you have someone that's with you, they're usually not the main stakeholder. Right. They are the neurotic person who's two levels below the stakeholder mm. who like needs to make their boss happy, make their boss happy. Oh, so they're yeah. the one who like gets the actual weight of getting the work done. Right. So they feel all this pressure to make it come out. And because there is no direct answer and it's very ambiguous, yeah. people who aren't used to ambiguity 
are like I used to hate ambiguity so much yeah. and I still don't love it, but I've become okay with it. Yeah. And those people are like, but where's the answer? Like we need right. the answer. And if we don't get it, we're costing much of money and it's due tomorrow. And it's like, just relax. Like it's gonna, <laughs> it's, we'll figure it out. We right. might not, but we'll make something up. Like we'll get something out of this. Don't worry. Right. Right. Yeah. I, another thing that I was thinking about is like sample size. Cause you were talking, yeah. talking about, you know, like going in and doing these sort of, in person like observational things like uh, i've i've kind of heard a lot of different things about sample size like maybe like eight to ten people Mm -hmm. roughly or just like when you start to get the same answers yeah but you know is there is there any sort of hard and fast rule um like would smart design just say like okay like while they're planning something out okay so we need to set up you know, 10 people. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, next up, like next step after that is three people more in depth or how does that work? I think it always starts with a good screener. Yeah. Like you get good after a while of writing your screeners and figuring out what you need to know and what types of people you need. That's super helpful when you're working with an agency who helps bring you people Mm -hmm. because there are literally people that make their living just getting calls from places like you want to go try this cereal do you want to go do this thing like the people that just test stuff for a right. living um those people are not the best in the, the day because they're there for money not to help which is also why I like the friends and family like acquaintance type situation yeah um but yeah i mean the group size itself i think eight to ten is actually a little large mm. i feel like i would say probably like five to like maybe like four to seven in yeah. there is probably pretty good because if you get too big you also need to think about group dynamics where there is always going to be someone who's or some people who are going to dominate the conversation, some people that are a little more quiet. Yeah. So you want it to be small enough that everyone can be heard, hmm. but large enough there's diverse amount of opinions. Yeah. And if your screener was good, hopefully people there have similar interests so that they all have somebody to contribute. Right. But at the end of the day, I would say too small is not good, but too large is not good. So like right. kind of Goldilocksing it. Like, I think I've told you a story before, even on this podcast, of we were doing validation testing for this company, and it was at Frog, not Smart, and we had all these concepts, and I had spent, like, weeks building these huge boards, and I was in the room taking notes in the back while one of the really senior people in the company was running this facilitation session, and there was... I'm from New Jersey, so I can make fun of them, I guess. But, like, this guy was the most Jersey motherfucker I've ever seen in my entire <laughs> life. And he was sitting there talking. Yeah. And there was always people. And he, it was, like, the definition of groupthink. Mm. Whatever he said, the group did. Yeah. And it was, like, everyone had their opinions. And then he talked to me, oh, no, they, that's what I meant. That's that's actually what uh, I was thinking. And it was terrible because he was, like, completely dominating the whole thing. Right. And the funny part was there was one part who goes, so you're telling me that I can say whatever I want and I'm not going to offend anybody? <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, yeah, you can say whatever you want. And he goes, that concept is the stupidest fucking thing I've ever seen. Whoever made that is a goddamn idiot. And I'm sitting in the room. My project manager is on Slack, like, just sit there, just be quiet, don't say anything. And it was stupid. It was a ridiculous project. I was right. like, yeah, you're right. I fucking hate it too. But I like, you got to make stuff sometimes. Right. But like, if you have certain people, no matter what the size is, they can completely throw the whole session, which is why you need to have three to four, five sessions to kind of get a good litmus test average in the middle. Yeah, that's interesting. So uh, I I was kind of imagining when you were describing things that you were interviewing people individually and not in a group. Because I, I always think that group, like group sessions... Oh, uh, that's even the sample size. Gotcha. Y- well, that, but just like, I mean, I, I've always had the impression that when you get groups together, I mean, there there's, of course, like a lot of uh, what's... Uh, focus groups and mm-hmm. things like that. Um, I, I always thought like you, you end up with that situation yeah. of somebody dominating and, and so like individual would be preferable. Yeah. Is it like a budget thing? Like, I think it's both. Uh, okay. So as I'm, we're talking about this and I'm kind of molding my thoughts as we're going. Right. And I feel like you would do more of a focus group earlier on with large group people talking where right. there's not like huge high stakes yet. It's more of just a gathering information. Right. Then you'd take that, go and make some concepts and then you'd have one-on-one sessions. Like the ones where I'd have prototypes, that's one participant, maybe two maximum, yeah. but mostly one. And that's where you're getting specific feedback in what you're doing. Right. And then you'd refine it and do another round with different people. Sometimes you'd bring back the previous people to see what they thought about the changes and things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you're talking about that, 
eight to 10 is great, but honestly, as many as you have budget for. Right. But eventually you kind of start hitting a wall of like hearing the same stuff. So it's just a waste of time. Right. Yeah. Um, I guess the, oh, I had a question. I can ask you some questions too. You, you can ask, you, go for it. I, uh, I got some. I'll ask you later. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, um, gosh, ask me a question right now because I'm trying to f- remember what the question so was. How did Lifetime Brands put design research in when you were there? I mean, the, the thing, like the thing with Lifetime Brands was a lot of the projects were very much like handed down to us from on high. Mm-hmm. And it was like, okay, we need to design the next potato peeler for this new line of, you know, KitchenAid Mm -hmm. products. And it's like, okay, so we have this assortment. Here's the visual brand language is kind of already established. And like a lot of it, I mean, the thing about Lifetime was there were a lot of um, like benchmarks. Like basically you would have, okay, this is like our the best peeler we have of all Mm. the competition. This is the best, you know, whatever we have of all the competition and like learning from that, interacting with not just that one, but other ones as well. So doing a lot of like, we had a kitchen where we would test things out. Um, But the timelines were such that it was like, you were moving fairly, I would say fairly quickly through the process. Mm -hmm. So it was less, it was less about like, you know, interviewing anybody or doing that, it was more like competition based and, and like also, you know, we would 3d print things and test things out ourselves. And like, that's where, you know, and, and I don't know, like, you know, I think that obviously if you could do that, the research, it would, it would at least enrich your case for like why something is valuable, significant, a feature to add, Mm -hmm. something like that. But, you know, what I often struggle with is like, is this idea that I feel like research is held on this very high pedestal. And does it, does it deserve to be that high on a pedestal? Especially when you're talking about things that the complexity is, is fairly low. Mm -hmm. You know, I like at Lifetime Brands, we had a, a design uh, you know, like team that was 30 people. So you could get a lot of people, a lot of voices, you know, you could walk around the department and just ask people to use things. Mm -hmm. So you kind of had people there that you could, that you could use as sort of like for testing. And sometimes we would set up in the kitchen at lifetime brands or the cafeteria and have people come in and and do things. So I, I don't know. What do you think about that? I mean, I, I kind of agree where it's like design research is this holy grail thing that everyone says you have to do and you do to a certain degree, but I feel like at least I've only done consulting my whole career. So I feel like a big part of design research is getting insights, but also just getting our team up to speed on what the fuck it is we're designing. Right. So like it's kind of a double edged sword where it's like if you're at lifetime brands and you're doing a category that you really know, you're going to need design research because the worst thing you can do with design, the cardinal sin is designing for yourself. Right. But if you know a category, like you already have most of the legwork done, like you right. don't have to figure out exactly every single little thing that you might know. But for me, if I've never done a self measuring cup, yeah, I need to go and do research and figure out who used these, why, what's that stuff for. So mm. it's kind of, it's for client and for consultant as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess I did see pitfalls in that especially when we were trying to do like new and innovative type of things is like, it would just be a lot of isolated work, but there was nobody, I don't know. I I can't say that there was nobody encouraging you to get out and to do things, but especially when you're first starting out, like I feel like unless you're at a place that's encouraging research, oftentimes all you're trying to do is just like, keep up with the workload Mm -hmm. and like learn, you know, learn how to design things for production, which was something that, you know, we had to learn at, uh, lifetime brands, like take things from like soup to nuts, basically all the way through to like production drawings. And so like our focus was around that, I think like, but also we had people in the department who was like, Oh, he's the knife expert. He's the, Mm -hmm. you know, peeler expert. Like we had people within the department who were kind of like, you know, uh, separated out as being like the experts in certain categories and that you should go to them if you're doing something in that. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, I, you know, that's the thing that like, I would love to just jump into with you. Like, I think it's really interesting to talk about all this research stuff, but you know, say there's somebody in a place that doesn't necessarily have this like design research regimen, mm -hmm. like what, what can they do, you know, considering like deadlines and all those kind of things, like, are there simple things that they can do to improve the work that they're doing? So it's kind of connected, I think, but something that you just made me think about was you said subject matter experts. Mm -hmm. So that's something. So when I went to Frog, design research was still very much there, but it was very different. Mm -hmm. It was much more on like a strategic level of research, right. like how to get companies to get behind something, behind an initiative, not so much of like, what is the next feature for this thing? Mm. So it was, it, we had some of those projects, but a lot of them were like bigger, like meaty strategic things of like helping a company figure out where they should be going. Right. Um, and one way in which we would get through things very quickly was they had a database where it was all subject matter experts on every topic you can ever think of in your entire life. If you're at a company that doesn't like design research or doesn't want to pay for it, this probably isn't great for you, which is why I said I'm like kind of conflicted on it because it is expensive. But it was a quick way where it's like we were doing a project and we basically found six subject matter experts on tangential fields mm -hmm. and interviewed them all in two days. And then all of a sudden had a very solid grasp on like the bulk of that category. Right. So that's at least a quick way to just like download it into your brain and get it. Yeah. But you need to be in a company or have the means on your own to be able to facilitate that, to kind of get that download. Right. But at the same time, like the internet, like <laughs> just read stuff, buy a book, like yeah. go get stuff. Yeah. I, there have been many jobs that I've just like looked up YouTube videos of people mm -hmm. I think when we were at Lifetime Brands, we had a subscription to, what's the what's the company that does all like the reviews, like the the professional reviews of different products? Oh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I the name. You, no, the name is ex is escaping me right now. It's like a it's like a specifically for kitchen wares. Uh, yeah, I. I'm not going to remember it in this podcast, but I think I know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. So, I mean... Oh, you consumer, would, consumer Reports. It, yeah. I think it might have been Consumer Reports uh, and, you know, specifically about kitchen tools and gadgets and things like that. But we would watch those videos. I would just like... I would honestly... I Sometimes I would just like look at Amazon mm -hmm. reviews. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, Which and, can be maddening. Be careful <laughs> of that one. <laughs> Especially for your own stuff. Right. Oh, yeah. No, I, I've definitely... I... Yeah, I will say and and read. I'm sorry to to say this to you while you're on the podcast, but okay. I uh, I had one I had one product that I did at Lifetime Brands for KitchenAid, and one of the reviews was better than the OXO version. <laughs> it's fine, <laughs> and I was like, yes, that's good. I I don't even stake an OXO. You can say whatever you want. Listen, I was just really stoked. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Um, but uh, yeah, so um doing that kind of thing. I did that a lot, like, and watching even just like YouTube videos of people reviewing things mm -hmm. is really great because they're often very candid. Um, especially if they don't have a lot of subscribers, they're just like, you know, <laughs> screw it. Yeah. Uh, they're not going to lose ad revenue if they curse. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> but you know, the thing is, is that like after lifetime, like a lot of the places that I've been working in, such as Peloton, it's like Peloton, is like they know kind they pretty much know what they're designing mm -hmm. and i will say that for the treadmill there was a lot of user interviews done yeah. prior to it and and i think a lot of it was um was just to figure out like what kind of features people would be interested mm -hmm. in for the treadmill yeah i think honestly the the most critical part of design research is just preparation right like when i worked at frog kind of moving a step ahead from smart it was like i said larger scale things so there we'd have lots of workshops right so we would do crazy things like future casting workshops where we would literally create fake worlds with fake scenarios mm. and have immersive rooms built for this thing to get clients into to have them think about much higher budgets obviously like <laughs> craziness um of like what this place could be right and all that prep work takes people who are like 
I, I do accounting. I don't know what this is. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I don't know. This could be that. And they get yeah. all excited. And like getting an adult excited about something <laughs> is a hard task. Right. But it's how you kind of get the client on your side, how you get things to come out. Right. And obviously, there's like prep work. Is this a lot of goes like when we had big workshops for Frog or Smart, we would spend two to three weeks preparing for that like yeah. 40 hour weeks if not more for several people getting ready right like preparing like props and things to try out or workshop materials or like just coming with all that stuff because the biggest thing about design research which we haven't even talked about yet is what do you do with all the research right and that's like even a simple synthesizing shit, like say you and i are doing research if you're doing the interview if i'm up there and i have blue post-its for quotes um, orange post-its for insights and green post-its for observations. Yeah. Like even just that and having it bucketed on a big board of like participant, three categories, participant, three categories. And then you just kind of slowly move it over at the end. You've saved yourself hours of synthesis hmm. because synthesis at the end, when you have hours of videotapes or hours and hours of notes can be daunting. Yeah. And that's where, even if you're just the person, I'd say just like it's an integral part, taking the photos Everyone afterwards sits down, debriefs, and right. goes over all of it, and that's where the the actual gold comes from. Yeah, that's crazy. I I I think that's really funny the whole future casting thing because it sounds like it's just called future casting in order to like in order to shake that one or two like people the client like out of their like you know uh, just being very guarded about expressing yeah. their opinions. It's like imagine a world. It is. <laughs> It's like that movie, In a World. <laughs> well, it's, it's crazy shit. Like, say we're designing a laptop. Yeah. Say, okay, we're going to talk about a post-apocalyptic world where the internet doesn't exist. <laughs> like, serious, we've done things. We did, like, we also do mild to wild for everything. Right. Like, the wild one is like, there's no world. What do you do with this? But it's yeah. around whatever specific topic you're talking right. about. And it forces you to think if the thing that I spent, because these people that you're working for, their life is that topic. Yeah. So getting to think about if that topic didn't exist yeah. is very important because then you can start thinking about how to break down the tried and true ways in which they've worked. Yeah. And that's where you can start making new things, which is a really hard thing to do, especially as organizations get larger and larger. Right. That's crazy. So. I, I, I do want to touch on something else that you were that you were kind of talking about. And like one of the things that I know about smart design and maybe I think you've said to, just to me off the podcast about Frog that they don't necessarily like design researchers. Mm -hmm. Like d does Frog still have design researchers or? I think there's like a handful left. Yeah. But I know smart has design researchers. Yes. Yeah. As far as I know. Yeah. So like, I mean, is it, like, cause as we're talking about this research, like, were you ever leading the research or was this on the design researchers mm -hmm. and were you like actively engaged, but not necessarily the lead? Honestly, it depends on the size and the budget for the project. Right. Smaller projects. I would just lead my own design research. I would get it all done. I would like go post up at a a Walmart somewhere and just watch people shop. Yeah. Um, I don't know why I said Walmart. There's none. There's no Walmarts around here. I guess like a Target or something. Yeah. Um, but if it's a bigger project, there'd be more of a design research person. Something that I find interesting and like kind of irks me a little bit is how also if you're a strategist, you also get lumped into design research. Mm. Anyone, if you want to double your salary, gets to get the title strategist because all of a sudden you can do anything. You can oh. do everything. All of a sudden you're everything and everything and you're perfect. <laughs> But like, I wouldn't go up against a strategist, Reed. They will strategize on how to take you down. Uh, I wouldn't win. <laughs> I can get mad about it. Yeah. But like, it's the same. Uh, that's the whole, I'm not going to get in that conversation. But <laughs> that being said, um, strategists are people that I love working with because they fill in the gaps I don't have. Right. But for some reason, somehow, like, design research and strategy became like the same thing. And I was like, wait. That's like being like, I'm an industrial designer and I'm also a chemist. It's like, yeah, yeah they, like, I guess not that drastically different, <laughs> but like, I guess it's kind of like saying I'm an industrial designer and a mechanical engineer. Right. Like, I can't, I understand their language, but I can't do that fully. Right. But because of that, if you had a larger budget, you usually get like a strategist type person. Gotcha. And I think a big reason that those type of people get pulled in for design research projects is because they know how to take the research and put it in terms that the client will understand which at the end of the day is how you advance your career. Right. Learning how to speak client language mm. and knowing how to 
manage expectations with them yeah. is the way in which you do leaps and bounds in your career. Oh, man, I really want to ask about that, but I feel like that's another different, topic different for another day. How to advance your career? <laughs> well, just how to speak client. Oh, I'm still figuring it out. But yeah. <laughs> it's a lot Cause, of listening. Because that's because that's the thing that I that I'm thinking about as I'm sitting here and and hearing these these stories is like. Part of the part of the thing when I think about like in-house designer versus consultant is I feel like a lot of what a consultant does is continually like validate their existence in a way mm-hmm. by by like doing this research and showing it to the client and saying like and here are the valuable things that I got out of that. I feel like a consultancy is always trying, not that an in-house designer is not trying to prove their worth and their value, yeah. but I feel like there is a, a big onus on on a firm to be like, we are valuable, we do this thing really well, and here are the results of this thing, mm-hmm. and, and here's how successful this product has become as a result. Yeah. It's also just the general ask of a lot of clients. Yeah. A lot of people who don't do design speak numbers. Right. And they want everything quantified. Yeah. And design's hard to quantify. So design research is the closest way in which you can do that. That's also why a lot of strategists get pulled in design research roles because they can quantify things. Yeah. And that also speaks much closer to design. Oh, yeah, that was called um, client language where a lot of strategists come from MBA programs hmm. so they can go out and do market analysis, which is still design research. It's just a quant versus a qualitative design research. Right. Um, so the things go hand in hand, but yeah, you're right. Figuring out how to get things into numbers of some sort will most likely make your clients, unless they're like the unicorn client that really gets design and yeah. people do exist like that, obviously, but that's like a good way in which to get people who hold the purse strings on your side, which is a very large first step in developing a relationship with someone who's going to pay you for a long period of time. Right. That makes sense. And something else I should say about lifetime brands is I think that, so we had these people called category managers mm-hmm. who were developing the plans for, cause it would literally be like, okay, we have this space in Walmart for this brand. Yeah. And like, here's how we're going to fill that space. And I think that they did do, a lot of uh, like quantitative research okay. around that. And then we would do, I guess, more of the qualitative. That's kind of how that was split up gotcha. from what I remember. Um, we should get into some questions because there there are questions that pertain to design research. I feel like we could talk about this for a lot longer. Yeah, um, we can do a part two. Yeah, we, we probably should someday because I feel like this is really valuable information. So these came in through the Discord. So some of them are like, multiple messages at once coming in and uh but i feel like Mm -hmm. ryan's overall question is is good so ryan hume said i'd like to know more about your experience following slash not following particular research methodologies in the real world world setting i.e thinking about sample size adjusting for biases and in relation to budgetary constraints i think you've touched on some of this yeah um is some research better than no research if you can't afford to do it in a scientifically rigorous ma- manner, maybe that could relate to qualitative versus quantitative in the evaluation of the research. Uh, and then how is that allowed to affect decision-making? I think this part of it mm-hmm. is, is some research better than no research is, uh, is an interesting question. Um, I think my gut reaction is yes. But then when I think about it, No, it's still a yes, I think. I mean, like, it's like you can never hurt it by no... You you always want to know as much about your end user and your client as possible. Yeah. So anything that's going to get you to have empathy for both parties is going to make the process smoother. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's definitely a... Always do as much as you can. Even if you're not, like, tasked to do it, you, as a designer, should have the due diligence to do something. Right. It's interesting, and and I would love to talk to her someday about this, but somebody that I mentioned before on the podcast, Rebecca Fennell, who we met at BYU, who founded uh, Boone. She founded Mm -hmm. this company called Fennell, and then she just founded this company called ZipTop, which are um, uh, silicone-like Ziploc-like containers. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I, I don't know exactly her process, but her Boone, like her sort of like infant toddler company came out of like being a mother Mm -hmm. and it's like as a designer is it enough 
to be the the person that's like going through the pains of having to use a product in a certain market segment because mm-hmm. that's essentially it seems like what drove her to start designing for that because she was like interacting with all these products deeply s- dissatisfied with yeah. all these products it's an interesting question because I think it kind of goes against what I said before. And I think what you and I were taught at Virginia Tech of like designing for yourself is the worst thing you can do. Right. Where um, some cases, I guess you are the expert. And yeah. I don't know. It's hard where it's like, can you empathize enough with yourself that like, and the other thing is, is like, I think as designers, one of the things like Michael DeTullo just had just had an article on Core 77 talking about being like dissatisfied and how that's kind of the attribute of the designer. Mm-hmm. And it's like, like uh, sometimes I'm, I feel like, would it, is it not enough to just be a designer interacting with things deeply dissatisfied and you can sort of take, take it from that step just to be like, you know what, I'm deeply... St- I'm I'm deeply dissatisfied with this and I'm going to create this concept, put it out in the world as like a Kickstarter and see how people react. So I think what I would say to that is having a subject matter or having something you I observe as being poor quality, that's a good start, mm-hmm. but it can't be where you finish. Hmm. Or I think you still have to do due diligence and validate if your idea is actually what it is yeah and also i think this about myself where it's like i can have lots of good nuggets of ideas but right. i need to work with people like you or my coworkers or anyone like speaking with my girlfriend whatever it is like to make the idea grow into something better right. and that's why you still should do due diligence on design research because also i think the reason i was getting like hairy about it before was Yes, you're a subject matter, but you're not every subject matter. There right. are people who have the same scenarios that have very different actual like life circumstances around it. So I think you can start it, but you still need to use design research to grow it into a encompassing idea that's not only servicing you. I think something you and I would know from working at Quirky is that people submit ideas of like, I hate napkins. <laughs> napkins blow off my table and they get all mad. And it's like a very specific problem. Right. But actually napkins blowing off tables is a big thing. And like, if you did, I'm not sure why I brought this topic up. I think it's because yeah. you're in your kitchen. But like, <laughs> but like if you did design research, you'd figure out like how you can actually grow that into an idea that's not just solving your specific problem, but making one that's actually marketable to a larger audience. Yeah. Well, and I also feel like like, like maybe we didn't really touch on like the types of research. Like, are there big categories that we could just like list off right now? Oh, big cat. I mean, I think we talked about a few where there's market analysis in mm-hmm. the beginning. Um, I think every student does the the two by two, the matrix, like the standard strategist two by two. Yeah. Um, and then there is what's it called? Qualitative research, which can go into lots of different directions of basically, um, we call them intercepts, where you just go into stores and just talk, walk up to random people and talking about things. There's um, shop alongs, there are uh, in home sessions, there is, um, what's it called? What's it called when you bring people together in uh, focus groups? Yeah. Uh, and then, I don't know, I mean, honestly, you can break it down so far. Yeah. But I mean, really, if you want to be simple, it's qualitative and quantitative. How do you find what right. you want? Well, and I think we should we should uh, clarify what what that first one we were talking about is for in case there is somebody out there who doesn't know the two mm-hmm. the two axis. Nick's mom. <laughs> Nick's mom. I need to meet you. Pay by attention the way, at some point. I've heard so much about you. Pay attention. Take out your notebook. Uh, so yeah. So basically, you have two axes, and you put something like. Uh, what like like low price price point, high price point, mm-hmm. and then what functionally driven, design driven? Like yeah. you just put you put two, uh, what would you call them? They're things that are not subjective. Yeah, it can't be like ugly, beautiful. Oh yeah, it has to be like big, small. Yeah, stuff that you can actually quantify. And then you just basically plot products on there to figure out where there is an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, anyway, Ryan, good question. Thank you for submitting that. Uh, and then Andrew Hodgson. So this, this gets back into, 
um, you know, a while ago, we kind of talked about intuition versus mm -hmm. research. So uh, Andrew writes, uh, when do you know when to go with your gut, make an intuition-based intuition decision versus do more research? Reading Johnny Ives' biography, recently I came across a quote from the book, some designers believe in the more research, the better the solution. I personally believe in common sense and intuition. Yeah. Personally, I believe that certain things will always require research uh, i.e. target market and user research, but some elements of design such as form can be based on intuition. Would be great to hear your take on this. I think that's an interesting one because I think a lot of times designers hide behind research because they're too afraid to make a decision. Mm. So they just want to have more and more and more research. Right. So there is a point in which you should stop researching and yeah. there is a point in which you are paid to be there. So your intuition is valuable and is actually monetarily like... I don't know, equatable to something. Yeah. So I think the research gives you the ammunition for your intuition to decide what's right. Yeah. So it's a mix of both. And I think it's hard when you're a student or right out of school because your intuition is still being honed. And that's something that everyone's intuition is always being honed. Right. Like, I think it's kind of like that bell curve. Like as you get older, it gets like it's slower and slower. Like there's a giant uptick in learning when you're younger and like right in school or out of school. Yeah. But um, I think it's a mix of both. Like if you go just an intuition, maybe that's what I meant before of the worst thing you do is design for yourself. If you just go off your intuition, that is where you can get into trouble. Hmm. But if you have intuition backed up by research, that's where I think you can feel like I've done the due diligence and I really feel confident about this. Yeah. The thing that I would say, especially to students about intuition is your intuition is probably terrible right now. Like <laughs> that, that's the thing is like, you know, I, I think research becomes intuition mm -hmm. later. And it's like, I can like looking back at my ideas and my forms and everything early on in the, in my design career and early on in school, it's like, it doesn't at all reflect my capabilities now based on like what I've gained through just, you know, practice and research and all of these things yeah. like that stuff does come baked in later. And I feel like, I, I don't know, like maybe there's a case to be made that later on down the road, you have better intuition than you do. And like, maybe the research isn't as significant because mm -hmm. I feel like, I feel like especially students, coming out of school, going into their first job, they're trying to be hot shots. They're trying to like, they're trying to do like really out there concepts, mm -hmm. you know, to maybe like just kind of show off, maybe pr like validate their existence. And that as you get older and hopefully wiser throughout your career, like, you know, you kind of like know where to go with a certain project and like the pitfalls that you've encountered throughout your career. Yeah. I, I, I had a question, which is, uh, have you ever had an example of a project where you did a lot of research or just like your typical amount of research and you would say the project failed? And then on, on the other side of that, is there a project you did very little research for and it mm. succeeded? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, it's actually something I've been meaning to post to Instagram because I haven't posted much recently. Um, was I did this project of like the future of bag clips mm. and we did all this research and we did like shop alongs, in-home research and all this stuff. And we came to the conclusion that people want bag clips that are made of wood <laughs> <laughs> because they want something that fits into the home decor and right. doesn't feel so plastic and like a fridge magnet. Yeah. So I made all these prototypes of these wooden clips and all these things like super simple, like yeah. this solid Oak and like figure out how to manufacture them. And then the end of the day, they are too expensive and the project died and it never went anywhere. But it was like several months of working on clips for like kitchen. <laughs> and that was it. So that was one where we did a ton of research, came up with an idea. The client loved it. But then all of a sudden reality kicked in. It was like, that's, oh, that's, no. that's gone. That's not gotcha. going anywhere. Um, but then like one where like very little research and it was went really far was like, um, I guess maybe like the backdrop project. That mm. was one where... Um, I've painted a lot in my life. Like when I was a kid, I used to paint people's houses just in the summer to make right. money. And like my grandfather taught me all about it. Cause he was always like, you always do everything yourself. You do it yourself and you yeah. learn. And, um, it was just something I thought about 
that was one where I didn't need as much research for the specific part I was working on. I'm not right. talking about the project as a whole because the project as a whole was very comprehensive. But for me, it was like, what is it like when you open this? What do you want to feel when you're painting? What like These are people that are new homeowners, new apartment owners or renters. They want to have this magical experience. They want to feel like they're masters of their space and they want to be able to have an experience. They feel like a professional, even if they're watching YouTube videos and how to paint crown molding or something. Right. And from that, it was a lot more of going around the office, asking questions, looking at my own experience. And then that thing was real like a few months later. Right. So that was one where it was a lot of intuition with a little bit of internet research and that actually went somewhere. And the other one was a ton of research and it went nowhere. Yeah. That's interesting. Cause I, cause I have, you know, I have this idea that like, you know, we, people often say that design is this crossroads or between science and art. Hmm. And I feel like there is like the artist part of the designer where like a lot of times recently, I'm just like trying to think about like, like th- things that have impacted me during my life, like feelings that I've had towards certain things and trying to like transfer them into the products. Cause I think that Mm -hmm. like storytelling and all of that, like if you can find a story that resonates with people, that's like really powerful and can like make something a lot more than, than what it is like seemingly on the surface. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I think that's what like artists do really well is they like find these moments throughout their life or find moments in their current life where like something is is really profound and they just feel like they have to explore that. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe scientists as well, like scientists can sort of like get obsessive over like something so specific and want to like blow it out. I, I think that's maybe where they are the same, but like the results are somewhat different. Yeah. Um, well, it's kind of like why I guess designers want to follow intuition more. Right. Because it's coming from a moment in your life that makes you feel like it's validated. Right. So it means more to you. So it's, it's why it's easy to fall into the pitfall of going with your gut and yeah. not trusting research because right. sometimes your gut and your research butt heads with each other right uh ideally they'll go together or if they don't you'll figure out a way to kind of make them marry each other and be happy yeah but yeah yeah it's interesting i i I think i bring this up a lot i bring up an music analogies and comedy analogies a lot where it's interesting to listen to comedians talk about how they like it's like 10 years of failing for them like they Hmm. go up in front of audiences and they try to relate to the audience and it's like you know they oftentimes bomb like they just consistently like will get no laughs until like one day they start to get laughs and like things start to click and then they start to figure out how to craft bits but oftentimes it's like they start from zero when they start like to put together a new act yeah and it's like for designers it would be nice. I mean, it sounds like smart design had had something akin to this where you're like bringing people in to test with the new prototypes. But it'd be great if like you could just send like somewhat of a final finished thing directly to somebody mm-hmm. in like no time that's like almost as finished as it can be to have them immediately like start using it. So that is another type of research you can do. Yeah. Where I worked on a project with Joey, who's also on this podcast. Oh, yeah. When I say worked on it with him, I was the intern. It's his project. I helped out on it. But it was this um, drinking concentrate bottle thing. Oh, yeah. And I'm pretty sure it's shareable, but I don't want to be the one who gets in trouble. So Is it the Drinkfinity thing? Okay, you said it. Yeah, we we talked about it on the podcast. But yeah, it was like this Drinkfinity thing. And they gave them to people in the office and everywhere else. And you had to keep a journal for two weeks oh. on like how you used it. Cool. And then you would report back and give this journal with photos and anecdotes and things. And that was a way in which we weren't even there. And But then that's like a synthesis overload where you get like oh my gosh. two weeks worth of stuff from like 20 people. It's like yeah. you need like a team to go through all that and right. sift through it. But yeah, you can do that as well. That's crazy. Yeah, I can't imagine going through all that research. Yeah, you need someone with patience <laughs> who, who, who like can really read and remember and keep 
the let the high things bubble up and everything else sift to the bottom and not yeah. get bogged down by all that information. Yeah. But I feel like also a lot of people now are using Kickstarter as like a way of at least doing, I guess, market research because it's not necessarily like functionality mm. testing. Like that would be an interesting thing for Kickstarter to get into, which is like, hey, like, do you want to fund this project and be a part of like the 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 development of it, like the research of it. It's kind of like, remember we worked at Quirky and how much their design research was complete bullshit. <laughs> it was basically the community could like do surveys. So on paper, they were quantitative numbers. Right. But like you could be working on a construction hat and you could have a grandmother who's never touched a hammer in her life giving her opinion. Right. Which doesn't mean that's invalid, but it means that you're getting it from a group that's so diluted. That right. It's like, what does that number even mean? Right. You, you need to be able to uh, like pick out the experts mm -hmm. and be like, what are they saying about this? And read, we, we need your expertise on, on <laughs> hair care because th so this is the last question. Connor McElveen asks, Reed, what what's your hair care regimen? You've got a good you got a good hair head, 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 head of hair. I don't know. Honestly, I I didn't have long hair until recently. Yeah. I guess like in the last like I guess now it's kinda of two years. Yeah. I just kinda of stopped cutting it. <laughs> and then my girlfriend makes all these awesome uh, like essential oil things. Where yeah. She puts all of this stuff in it that makes your hair like happy. Yeah. So did you hear that, Allison? <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's not hard. We can yeah. bring it. It's like, I don't know. It was a whole bunch of stuff, but, um, she makes it for me like once a month and yeah, I just, I don't know, wash your hair like once or twice a week and yeah. put some oil in it. And you, the thing is you got to stick past the awkward part. Right. <laughs> Cause there's always that part where I like finally just, getting through the awkward part where like it wants to stick out and do weird shit. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know. It's just like, honestly, when you get long hair, it's kind of nice. He was like, do nothing with it. <laughs> and then you just like wake up in the morning, shower, let it dry. And then, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, uh, Connor, I don't really know. It looks it's, like from your Instagram photo, you have beautiful red hair. So I don't really know what's going on, but it's uh, read. Don't be modest. It's a beautiful head of hair. Thank you. Yeah. I didn't know that until recently, but yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's nice to be nice and to compliment people. Thank you. You know? So anyway, uh, Reed, that was great. I feel like there's a lot in there and I feel like there's a lot more we could, we could take that. So we'll have to have you back on the podcast to, uh, yeah, to dive in and absolutely, uh, get on the discord. If, uh, this sparked any more questions for you guys, or if there's any personal experiences you want to share, share them on the discord. It's, uh, it's always a great conversation in there. Yeah. Um, and as always like, uh, subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple mm -hmm. podcasts, give us a rating that really helps us out. Um, and on YouTube, if you click that bell, you'll get a notification for when our next video comes out. I didn't know that. Um, yeah. And buy, buy some pins, uh, to support the podcast. Um, I think there is a link on the website, which is www.minordetailspodcast.com. And, uh, who's the shout out of the week? Oh my gosh. We didn't even, we didn't even think we read, th we can think of one. Reed, do you have one? Huh? Who do I follow that I like? Mm. I'm jumping onto Instagram right now. I'm tr I'm trying to think. I have a few off the top of my head, but I'm trying to make one that's like super interesting and weird. Um, my favorite one was Curbside Crowley, but he doesn't do it anymore. Oh yeah. He had some funky illustrations. You know, I don't think we've ever shouted out McKay. Okay, yeah. And that's is that him? The <laughs> uh. Th that's crazy. I th I don't believe we have. And if we have, I'm going to have to cut this part out of the podcast. But uh, McKay Nelson, he's an industrial designer and he moved to New York City not too long ago. He had some luscious locks. Oh, he's got some. Yeah, but he's he's chopped them off. Yeah, but he's gone. he's looking he's always looking good. Um, but McKay has become uh, a good friend and he's a very talented designer mm -hmm. um, who like. I really appreciate his focus on sort of like the more art direction yeah. side of things, but he, and he also does just like beautiful sketches. Um, and the coolest part is he's mostly self-taught. Yes. His, he went to, I forget what school he went to. It's I think the, it was university of Utah. Wasn't yeah. It? University of Utah. So I guess 
there it wasn't specifically an industrial design program it was just sort of like wasn't it design thinking yeah but he um yeah he's self-taught like he uh you know like that's that's amazing to me that somebody is self-taught got themselves to this point Mm -hmm. i think well actually i think um john mills do you remember john mills from from virginia tech no i think he's i think he moved to to oh. Utah and he was teaching at this school. So I think, I think McKay got an introduction to sketching from him. If that's I'm, cool. And if I'm incorrect, McKay, you'll have to correct me. If that's true, that's a really cool, like roundabout connection. We all have. Like, yeah. But, uh, McKay does beautiful sketch work and, uh, also really nice design. You should check out his website, especially he, he, mm-hmm. I think he made it himself. Um, just really inventive website, uh, in the way that he showcases his projects. Yep. Um, he's so also we, a really nice guy. He's a super nice guy. We uh, took the subway to the Core Seven Seven party last night. Oh yeah, we had some good conversation. It was good. nice. We got off of the wrong stop in Queens, walked for a while. It was yeah. an adventure. We figured it out. Yeah. So anyway, uh, if you don't already, give McKay a follow. He is at uh, McKay dot Nilsson, and that's M C K A Y dot N I L S O N. So yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Do Great. It. And uh, I would like to thank you, Reed, for coming back on the podcast. Of course. Once it's again. Always, it's always fun to hang out. Yeah. And um, anyway, uh, intro and outro, outro by Kiyoshi the Kid. Mm-hmm. And uh, as always, I'm at I Draw and Receipts. I'm at Reed Schlegel. And actually, something I never really shout anything out, but our form families thing is not doing well on Behance. Someone go fucking check that project out. <laughs> I don't usually get sad, but I was like, we put a lot of work into that one. Yeah. And it's like, it's like a hundred likes. Give which, it, give it some love. I don't know. I think that's the one time I've gotten sad about likes ever. And it's like that project. That was it. Give, give it some likes. We did, we did get a lot of you. <laughs> I, feel, hey guys, I feel like an asshole now. We're desperate. <laughs> well, we, uh, our, uh, the video that we also did a video with MakerBot, mm-hmm. um, which is up on YouTube. Uh, and that's got some good, a good view count. Dude, I haven't watched it. Is it is it good? Is it okay? I've watched a bit of it. It's pretty good. Okay, good. Yeah. I think I, I would love to do some more work around that. I think there's some more that we can explore with the form families. Let's do it. Um, but anyway, guys, yep. check it out on Behance. And then uh, hopefully we'll have Reed back on the pod soon. We'll talk about maybe some more research or another topic entirely. Nice. And you'll have, you'll have Nick back next week. Yes. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Never fear. Nick will be here. All right. Next week. Thank you, everybody. All right. Later.